Each of our lives is a story with its own setting, characters, and defining moments. Some of these moments lead to joy and success, while others are marked by struggle and grief. As a result, there are often chapters of our story that don't make sense, that we wish we could erase altogether. But even in the places where our story feels most broken, God is at work, rewriting the plot for our good and for His glory. Defining Moments, when God rewrites your story. Good morning. We were married on December 18th, 2010, and standing there on our wedding day, hand in hand, with all of our hopes and dreams for the lifetime ahead, vowing to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, pledging all of our love and fidelity, forsaking all others until death do us part. The last thing on either of our minds that day was the end of our marriage. It's incredibly overwhelming to stand here on stage and share the darkest parts of our story with you. But it's not because we're fearful of being found out or of sharing, but it's because we can't possibly share everything we would want you to know. Our story is not pretty, but it is filled with profound purpose. And so our hope today is that you will see parts of yourself in our story, and that as we share candidly how we witness God at work, that your own eyes might be open to where he may be trying to get your attention in writing your own story. I grew up in a home where my needs were lost in the chaos of being the third of six children. My dad worked long stretches of time away from the house, days, sometimes weeks, and my mother struggled with severe clinical depression and self-harm. Coming into my marriage, I convinced myself that my formative teenage years had no influence on who I was as an adult. But the truth is, I carried a deep-seated fear of rejection and vulnerability that were fueled by false narratives. I remember in my seventh grade language arts class, I was called on to read a paper, what I wrote, um, what I wanted for Christmas that day. And I remember standing at the front of the class and reading that first line, and it said, um, this year for Christmas, I am hoping and praying that my parents don't get a divorce. And instantly the tears came. And I remember quietly returning to my seat, but that class was silent. And I remember feeling so foolish and embarrassed and exposed. And it was in that moment that my core being decided that vulnerability wasn't safe. I didn't get my wish. And in the following months, um, my parents went through a very messy divorce marked by a very messy custody battle. You know, my parents always told me that they wouldn't make me pick between the two of them. Um, but one night, my, my dad came home real late, and he, he pulled me out of bed, and he led me to his bedroom, and he looked at me with this intensity, and he says, you love me, right? Yeah, Dad, of course, yeah, I love you. You like living here, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I like living here. Okay, sign this paper. There were guardianship papers, conservatorship papers that he used to go gain primary custody in court of me and my three younger brothers. So as you can imagine, I felt guilty. I felt responsible. Guilty for breaking up my family and responsible for my mom's spiraling depression and responsible for my dad's ensuing anger and drinking. Child Protective Services invaded every area of my life, disrupting any sense of normalcy and routine and schedule and repeatedly breaking my confidence. And somewhere along the way, I determined that no one is trustworthy, not even the people who say that they love and care for you the most. You see, I didn't have the maturity or resources or people in my life to help me navigate what I was walking through. And as I entered young adulthood, I didn't recognize the emotional scars 
that were being left on my heart. And even my best friends, some of the people that I turned to for safety and loyalty when things were sideways, fell short. When after the second year of college together, they broke our roommate agreement and they left and they moved out to go live on their own, leaving me with no one, nowhere to live, no one to turn to. You see, in the story I was writing for myself, vulnerability was not safe. No one could be trusted. No one wanted me. And nobody cared enough to ask how I was doing. And there's nobody in your life to reflect your value and mirror back your worth. You look for value in the reflection of counterfeits. So I turned my pain inward and I began medicating with addictions to nicotine and pornography. I protected myself from the risk of ever being hurt again, emotionally insulating myself and withholding myself from anyone and everyone. I don't have a childhood trauma story that is similar to my husband's, but I did grow up with a very superficial and surface level understanding of my faith. I was raised in the church and I don't remember a time in my life where I did not know Jesus. But somewhere along the way, I got it in my head that my worth and value was found in the opinions of others. So I approached nearly every relationship, including my relationship with Jesus, believing that if I just did all the right things, leaned in in all the right ways, checked all the right boxes and did all the right things and just managed everyone else's perceptions of me, then I would be valued and loved. My childhood was marked by achievement, clearly. I set out to craft for myself this perfect and enviable life. I idolized my marriage and my husband and most of all, probably my own effort. We both approached our marriage and our faith with a firm, white-knuckled grasp on the wheel of our lives. It has taken me years to realize that I had viewed my wife simply as someone who could meet my needs. I didn't know how to feel safe, emotionally, spiritually, intimately, with anyone, because I had never experienced that for myself. I treated people like objects for my own selfish and shallow ambitions and desires. I stoked my addictions in secret, and I carved out this double life in my over-compartmentalized brain, a life where I could love my wife and read my Bible and go to church and serve in small groups and lead people, all the while, allowing Satan to lead me deeper and deeper into my sin and into myself with no consideration for how my actions would affect other people. People don't just wake up one day and decide to blow up their life. James 1, 14 and 15 describe a progression where each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin when it's full grown, gives birth to death. You see, my story was marked by a series of small yeses to small temptations that set me on a path to ruin. And when my sin became full grown, it gave birth to death in the form of a 16 month sexual affair with another woman. Compartmentalizing the different areas of my life allowed me to slip easily between fantasy and reality for those months, continuing this cycle of sin shame, repeat. And I'd fully resolved myself that I was gonna take my sin to the grave. You see, Satan had convinced me that the thrill of sin was better than his design for marriage and for intimacy with my wife. And I'd given him a foothold in my heart to speak fear, fear that if I confessed, she'd take my kids and she'd leave me, just like everyone else had, and continuing this cycle of abandonment that had characterized my whole life. Bottom line is I was afraid. I was afraid that love wasn't enough to make her stay and love wasn't enough to help her forgive me. But God intervened. And in my most broken moment, about seven years into our marriage, my betrayal and all of its soul-sucking darkness came to light. I remember Aaron's words as both reckless and emotionless. The affair completely sideswiped me. I couldn't breathe. I was living this nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. 
My perfect do everything right marriage was stolen from me and like a fool, I didn't see it coming. And with a few heart shattering words, this pedestal that I had put my identity on had shattered too. As the reality of Aaron's betrayal unfolded, I remember thinking, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to kick him out. And so I told him to leave. But as he was walking out of the bedroom, I felt the spirit telling me that if you're gonna get through this, you cannot do what the world would tell you to do. And I'd like to tell you that in that moment, I had this great big hope for our marriage and compassion and forgiveness for my husband, but I didn't. I didn't have any of that. I was numb and I was broken and I was lost and I was shattered and all I had in that moment was Jesus. And so borrowing on the credit of God's faithfulness, I stopped him from leaving. In the weeks and months that followed, everything moved in slow motion, thank you. The normalcy of life around us was suffocating and confusing. I endured the whiplash of resentment and bitterness. Yes, I had chosen to stay, but there were so many days where I didn't want to. Days where I questioned my own judgment and sanity. The affair had wrecked every part of our lives and sent us spiraling into a deep and heavy depression that we would both carry with us for the next five years. It destroyed the safety of our bedroom and of sexual intimacy. It strained friendships and ended others. And when I wanted to scream, hey, look at me, I'm hurting, my marriage has died, and quite frankly, look how well I'm handling it. I had to pause as I coped with being in the middle of a very messy and broken and shameful story. You see, my suffering was incredibly isolating and unfair. And yet, if I wanted to honor my husband and our healing, I couldn't seek the affirmation and approval that I so desperately craved. I needed to trust that God alone was going to provide enough covering for us to heal, even though we had no idea what that would look like and no guarantee of the outcome. There's been a lot of life between that defining moment that day and this one here today. And it would be impossible, impossible to put into words the full weight of what we had to walk through and impossible to give credit to the grief and tears and doubt and countless hours of conversation and counseling and sleepless nights. And it would be easy to question, where was God? in all of this. He knew, right? Because all the while Satan had a hold of my heart, he knew. And although he didn't stop this tragedy from happening, I firmly believe he did rescue us out of it. And today we can look back and see how God had always been working, weaving this net of protection that we didn't even know we were gonna need. And with every effort to make our lives look radically different, we experienced his mercy and grace every step of the way. God gave us peace as we made space to reduce our commitments and step away from the busiest busyness of life so that we could focus on what was happening right in front of us. He nurtured in us a deep appreciation for community here at Preston Trail long before we ever walked through our trial where through resources like Reengage and counseling sessions, we had heard stories of his redeeming work that gave us hope that reconciliation was possible. We felt his love tangibly through an intentionally small group of people, some of whom are sitting in this room right now, those people who walked with us through the thick trenches of our valley and those people who were for us and for our marriage. People who would look me in the eye, look me in the face and say, we don't love you any less. People who would help carry the weight of grief and pain for several years alongside of us without hesitation. And with a lot of counseling and hard work, I began to put together the dots. Connecting the dots of the trauma from my childhood to how those false narratives had driven me to this secret life, this life built around patterns 
of secrecy and sin and death. And over and over and over again, God's grace and mercy showed up. Psalm 103, 8 through 12 says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. And he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us. <laughs> I'm so thankful that God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve because he is the only one worthy and capable of renovating my heart and my spirit and my mind and creating a reliance on him. And through this healing process, he's given me a new heart for my wife. And he's been reminding me every day of who he created her to be. And that by neglecting to do everything possible to enhance my relationship with her, I'd missed it, guys. I'd missed his design for intimacy and marriage. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. When you're reciting those words on your wedding day, the most horrible thing you think you'll have to walk to may be a debilitating, debilitating illness or even death. But the reality is, you're just two sinners sinning against each other, committing for the rest of your lives to try to outforgive one another. I've come to appreciate that in sickness and in health doesn't just mean physical health or even emotional health but also one's spiritual health. Aaron's affair was a tragic symptom of a much deeper brokenness, a division in his soul that could only be healed in Christ. And if God could do all that he's done for me and for those who love him, despite all the ways that we betray him daily, could I allow him to, uh, to write a new story through how I loved Aaron, even when he sinned against me and betrayed me so horrendously, and even when the Bible gave me a way out. There's a love song that I love by Andrew Peterson. It's called Dancing in the Minefields. If you follow me on socials, it's like every song I link to all of the photos of us. Because there's um, a section in that song that says, when I lose my way, find me. When I loose love's chains, Bind me, and at the end of all my faith, to the end of all my days, when I forget my name, remind me. I've come to see that Aaron had forgotten his name. He had believed lies that he was unloved and unworthy and unwanted, and if I didn't fight on his behalf, who else was going to? What is a covenant of marriage if not the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus for your spouse? And if the purpose of marriage is not to make us happy, but to make us holy and be a representation of how Christ loved the church, I must be willing to die to myself daily so that the testimony of God's faithfulness can go forward in my life. But I couldn't have possibly navigated that reality apart from Jesus. And it would not have been possible if Aaron had not also been willing to do the hard work of submitting to repentance. I'm forever grateful that God intervened that night over six years ago and that our story didn't end when it had every earthly reason to. And with every new opportunity God has given me and given us to share, it's erasing those old narratives. If you're unloved, you're unwanted, you're not worthy. And sometimes choosing to share means I do it afraid. I'm doing it afraid right now. <laughs> uh, but I, I've learned to trust the story. I've learned to trust his story. And I, I believe, when you come to believe and accept that God's way is better, there's no other response than to turn over the pen and the responsibility of writing your own story. Turning over the pen in daily obedience. And I stand here today, not the boss of me. I don't get to write my own story. And honestly, why would I? My way has only led to a counterfeit life. And for anyone here who's fearful of taking that step, take courage, stay steadfast. God will honor what you give him in earnest. My story looks different than what I expected. I've had to grieve this loss of what I thought our marriage would look like and release the hold I had on the story of my life. 
the one that I pictured in my mind on our wedding day would never come to be. And I've had to wrestle with this reality that just because our feet are firmly planted in hope and we are committed to pursuing God's best for our marriage doesn't mean that we'll get to experience all of that this side of heaven. That our marriage would be more fulfilling and richer and better than had the affair never happened. I certainly would like to hope that it will but I have to trust and believe that what God is doing through my heartache is more beautiful than any story that I would write for myself. And my story does not have to be finished for God to be good. Rather, the race that we are running is to be able to stand before God, living a life where his goodness is on full display. It's his goodness that has to be more powerful than my need to have a perfect marriage, than for everyone to like me, than to feel your affirmation and giving me value and worth in my life. His goodness has to be more than all of that. And it's our testimony today that because of him, we are living a real life story of redemption. So now we look back on January 12th, 2018, the day that my sin was brought to light and the day that our first marriage ended. And that's a defining moment in our story, but it's one that we celebrate every year. We celebrate God's rescue and we celebrate his redeeming work in both of our lives. And we celebrate that he's helping us build a life that's bigger than our grief and our mistakes. And we mark that day as the day our new marriage began. And we remain willing to stay on the potter's wheel, trusting that he's working all things out for his good. You know, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that the reality is that for some of you in this room, this story might be particularly painful because there are people in this room whose homes and childhoods were marked by brokenness. There are people in this room who are all too familiar with isolation and grief and suffering. There are people in this room who are struggling with fidelity and integrity and transparency in their own marriage. And there are people in this room who are drifting unknowingly in that space between their sin becoming full grown and death. So if you need to borrow hope from our story, here it is, it's yours, take it. Because we've come to understand it was never really ours to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing. Their story is powerful. And Aaron said at the end, it resonates with me so much that their story was never theirs to begin with. There's a piece of surrender there. They both had to surrender and they showed us beautifully what that was like. And it's been beautiful not only as a pastor preparing a sermon for today, but it's been beautiful as a friend to watch. You see, I don't know their story just because I learned about it for uh, today's sermon, which I've affectionately been calling the Thurman Sermon, because it rhymes. I don't know it just because of that. I know it because January 12th was the day Aaron confessed, but about a week later, they showed up on our doorstep. My husband and I's doorstep. We were home with a newborn, and they came in, and the air shifted. And I'll never forget us walking across my house. I'll never forget the chairs we sat in. I'll never forget Aaron's face as he then confessed to his friends. I'll never forget Claire's face, still fresh from the news. We hugged, we cried, we prayed. And you guys, they didn't just let us in that day as a general, hey, here's what we're going through so you can be praying for us, but then go deal with it in private. Like they let us in, in, into the messy middle, into the the daily text thread, the ups and the downs and, and the hard moments. And it wasn't easy and it wasn't overnight, but they let us into that unfinished space where God was doing the mending because God is a rewriter of stories. And when you get to see it up close and personal, when someone lets God rewrite their story, it is sacred. And I got to see God's character on full display in their lives, that God is a redeemer, that God is a restorer, that he will refresh parts of your story that are dry and weary and parched. He will restore a tattered and torn story. And that is not just true in the Thurman's story. It is offered for you in the Bible in today. It is offered wherever you are in the middle of your story. 
And so I wanna spend the next little bit talking about three truths about marriage as an offering for you in your own marriages. And you'll notice these are three things the Thurmans uh, mentioned in their story, and, and I wanna continue that conversation and give us a foundation that is worth standing on, a foundation where you too can see God rewrite your story. Whether your marriage is just uh, a little bit weary and you could use a pick-me-up, or whether your marriage is like the Thurmans and it feels like it's about to fall apart, my prayer is that um, God would meet you today. Now, before we do, I have two important disclaimers. One is that many of you in the room are single, and we are so thankful that our church is not just full of married people. We need people who are single around us. You give us a different perspective, so we value you. So if you're here today and you're single and you wanna be married someday, I hope God gives you a picture of marriage worth waiting for. And if you're in the room and you are single but you don't desire to be married, Oftentimes in the Bible, God talks about a God and his relationship with God and the people like a marriage. And so my hope is that you would get a picture of who God is. So if you're single, we're glad that you're here. And my second disclaimer is for those like Claire and Aaron mentioned, who for whom today might be particularly tender. If you've walked through for divorce for reasons such as this, a betrayal, or through, for abuse, or for some other reason, and if that's you, it's important for all of us to say that that's not a prescription for how you have to handle your story if infidelity is a part of it. It's not a prescription or a formula. Instead, it's a testimony of what God's done, uh, but it's not a formula for how, what you have to do. And so I want you to hear me say that today, there is zero place for shame today. There is zero place for condemnation or for comparison. Uh, the enemy shames God convicts. There is no place for shame today. There is no roadmap for navigating broken vows. Today is simply a story of what God did when they gave him the pen. And so as Bob Goff says, I love this, he says, keep your eyes on your own paper. Keep your eyes on your own paper. Look at the life in front of you, the marriage in front of you. If you're remarried, look at the, the marriage you have in front of you. Keep your eyes on your own paper and with grace and tenderness in mind and with our eyes on Jesus. Let's look at three biblical truths on marriage. The first, marriage is a covenant, not a contract. You heard Claire use that phrase that, that, that she was relying on this view of a covenant marriage. And I wanna double click on that word and trace the biblical origin. You see, uh, God talks about a marriage in the Bible as a covenant, multiple places. And he uses that word in opposition, in contrast to the word contract. When you make a contract with someone, you say, here's what I'm committing to, and here's what you're committing to, and hey, when you break the rules, like here's how I'm protected, here's what's gonna happen if you step out of your end of the deal, right? A contract is really about protecting me. And God talks about marriage not as a contract, but as a covenant, not about me, but about you. How can I serve you on this mission of following Jesus? It's vastly different. And covenants are not just between humans, actually God makes covenants with people. And so when we look at how God interacts in a covenant, it can speak to us. Exodus 19, this is a God talking to Moses, and this is just one example of God entering into a covenant with people. He says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. That's whenever he, he parted the Red Sea, right? We sang about that earlier. Now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, there's that word, then out of all the nations, this is talking to Israel, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you, Moses, are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses does that, and what does Israel do? If you've read the Old Testament, you know it's full of them saying they wanna follow God and then turning and living completely for themselves again and again and again. It's a story with death and destruction and war as God seeks showing up to his people and loving his people even though they keep running from him. And so we look at God in a covenant and even though Israel, the people, betrayed him, God chose to still keep showing up and he chose to keep sending Jesus and, and now it wasn't just that God wanted to use the Israelites for his glory, he said, hey, anyone who follows me, the Gentiles, all of us, most of us today, hey, you can be that same kingdom, that same priesthood. You see, God continued to fulfill his promises even when humans did not. And so when we view our marriage as a covenant, we can see that a covenant is about holding up our end of the deal even when you don't. And I'm not talking about staying in a harmful marriage. I'm just saying that on, on some sense, all of us will mistreat our spouse on some sense, we will all be mistreated by our spouse, right? In sickness and in health, when sickness comes, whether it's for one of you or your parents, right? There will be moments where you don't treat your spouse the way that you should treat them. There will be moments you lash out, maybe because you're in pain, but you lash out and you mistreat them. In sickness and in health, right? If for richer or poorer, money is one of the number one arguments in marriage. 
that we are all not holding up our end of the bargain that we say on our wedding day. And yet, when we view marriage as a covenant, it's not about protecting me, it's about giving back and, and helping this person as you grow in this journey of following Jesus. It's I'm gonna be faithful as far as it depends on me. It's not I do only if you do, it's I do. Because covenant love is love in action. First Corinthians 13, you may have had it ready at your wedding. It's a list of love in action. Pay attention as I read it, it's not feelings, it's action. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. These are actions of love. Whenever the Apostle Paul chose to define love in scripture, he didn't boil it down to feelings and butterflies and feel goods. He boiled it down to action. Love is choosing to be kind even when you are not treated kindly. It is choosing to honor even when you are dishonored. It is choosing to keep no record of wrongs even though there are wrongs and there are in all of our marriages. But this is the kind of love God calls us to. And it's the kind of love Jesus modeled on a cross. He chose love as an action, not a feeling. The night before he died, he wept. That was his feeling, sorrow, anguish, but he chose love as an action and I'm so thankful he did. And when you choose love as an action in your marriage and you choose to be kind and patient and not keep record of wrongs, you are bringing Jesus to your spouse. We all wanna see Jesus face to face and you may not be able to bring uh, Jesus face to face to your spouse, but you can be his hands and feet and you can model Jesus and this covenant love and you can get to be a part of them seeing God's character in your homes within your marriage. It's sacred and beautiful. A second biblical truth is that God wants to use your marriage to make you holy. Claire said this in her testimony, uh, holy as in more Christ-like. The theological word here is uh, sanctification. It's growing up in Christ-likeness. And one of the ways God often grows us was through other people. Proverbs 27, 17 succinctly says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And you, at first you can say, what does that mean? Well, just think about it. That God's design in marriage was to take two people, two very different people, with two different uh, Myers-Briggs personality tests, with two different Enneagrams, with two different ways of loading the dishwasher, with two different ways of parenting, with two different uh, speeds of driving, all the different differences, right? He took two people with completely different ways of approaching things and said, hey, do life together. Live under the same roof, share everything. Get along, it'll be fine. God's not surprised that our marriages cause frustration. God's not surprised that there's iron sharpening iron, but that iron sharpening iron is not for our harm, it is for our good. You see, God's not surprised that your spouse frustrates you. God didn't cause your spouse to frustrate you, they did that all by themselves. <laughs> but God will use it, he will use it to grow you because every frustration, ever, every moment iron sharpens iron in your home, whether it's over the dishwasher or something bigger, every moment a frustration happens, it can be a moment to pause and turn that frustration into fascination. That I'm so fascinated that God would make a human being fearfully and made in his image and wonderful and they would choose to load the dishwasher that way. I can choose my frustrations and let them turn into fascinations, to be fascinated with this human being that God gave me to do life with. And when you choose to pause, to embrace James 1, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, when you choose to pause between your frustration and your response, that's where holiness happens. That's where growth happens. That's where you grow up in Christ and little by little, kindness becomes easier. Patience becomes easier. And it doesn't just impact your marriage, it impacts every relationship you have. God wants to use your marriage to grow up as a parent. He wants to use your marriage to grow you up as a coworker. He wants to use your marriage to grow you up as a neighbor. You see, your marriage will be where you are sharpened and made more like Christ and then you will shine more brightly for the world to see. God has plans for your marriage far beyond any happiness and far more for his good and for his glory. And this is not just for you growing up, it's also for your spouse growing up because then you get to see them becoming who God made them to be. If you're a parent, you know that feeling of seeing your kid become who God made them to be, the little, the little budding characteristics that are growing, well, I can see it. It's not quite full grown yet, but I can see it. If you'll choose to have eternal eyes, you see the same thing in your spouse. Oh, they're not quite there yet, but I can see it. Oh, if they would just surrender to God that one more thing, I can't push them, but man, I'm rooting for it, I'm praying for it, I'm cheering it on. You get to see it. 
Timothy Keller, one of my favorite pastors and theologians, describes it this way. Within the Christian vision of marriage, here's what it means to fall in love. It's to look at another person and get a glimpse of what God is creating and to say, I see who God is making you and it excites me. I wanna be a part of that. I wanna partner with you and God in the journey that you are taking to his throne. And when we get there, I will look at your magnificence and say, I always knew you could be like this. I got glimpses of it on earth, but look at you now. Would God characterize your marriage as saying, you're constantly saying, I knew you could be like this, that you're rooting for one another, cheering one another on. That's the joy of marriage. You see, when I say that marriage is for your holiness, some of you hear that it's all serious business and there's no fun in that, but there is great joy in seeing someone grow up in who God made them to be. There's great joy in that. But it does involve, as Aaron said, giving God the pin. You gotta lay down what your picture of a good marriage is. Claire had to lay down her picture of marriage as having no suffering. Aaron had to lay down his picture of marriage as being all for his own benefit. We have to lay down the picture of marriage that we have that's a false counterfeit because it is sucking the life out of our marriages and sucking the joy out of our lives. We have to lay down a marriage about comfort, about happiness, about our satisfaction, about our own gain because marriages are for God. It's the triangle analogy, you may have heard it. As you head towards God, you do get closer to one another. The great companionship with your spouse comes as you both seek after Christ. You see, your marriage was designed to make you holy. And the happiness, the joy, that's a byproduct. But seek holiness first. But that's a grander vision of marriage. That's not one the world is out there talking about. Which is why my third point is that covenant love is only possible because of Jesus Christ. Covenant love, even in part, showing and modeling covenant love to your spouse is only possible because of Jesus Christ and his life and his death and his resurrection. Because we could not do it on our own. I will tell you, I could not do it on my own. On my own, I'm selfish. On my own, I try to control. On my own, I tend to keep record of wrongs. On my own, I can be harsh. That, that's me. I need Jesus to love and model covenant love to my husband, and I want to, but I need Jesus to help me do that. First John 4.19 says that we love because he first loved us. This order is of the utmost importance because this is our ability to show covenant love to our spouse. It, it comes when we understand this verse, that we love because he first loved us, that he first, that true love goes first. It initiates, it doesn't wait to feel good. And that's what Jesus did for us. He went first. And when we go to him first and we get our love need met first, then and only then are we able to show up to our spouse not needing something from them in return. We get our love tank full from Jesus. And then we can love our spouse without needing something in return, without, without needing to feel that back. That's the only way we can do that. Without Jesus, there's no way. We need our spouse to make us happy. But with Jesus, we can love pure in motive and eyes to see the spiritual reality at play. But only with Jesus. Only with Jesus could Aaron have hope that confessing would not lead to the destruction of his life, but the freedom and the resurrection of his life. Only with Jesus could Aaron have had done the hard work of untangling childhood wounds that shaped his perspective. And maybe some of you today, you need to hear that and pay attention to that, that he did the hard work of untangling childhood wounds and paying attention to them. But only with Jesus can you look back at your childhood with that kind of reflection. Only with Jesus could Claire have chosen to embrace a story she wanted nothing to do with. Only with Jesus could Claire have told Aaron that night to stay in their bedroom when all worldly advice would have said to kick him out. Only with Jesus, only because she was following Jesus, only because she was attentive to the Holy Spirit, could she hear the Holy Spirit's voice right next to the one screaming in her head to kick him out. Only with Jesus can we show covenant love to our spouse. And if you follow Jesus, you have access to that same power. You have access to that same only Jesus kind of power in your life. And if you're struggling to love your spouse, just in daily annoyances, Jesus can help you choose covenant love. And if you're struggling to love your spouse through deep wounds, Jesus can help you choose covenant love. You have access to the incredible, redeeming, restoring power of our God, but you will need to give him the pin.